Good morning, West End Church of Christ. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We're rejoicing and being exceedingly glad in it. Amen. Our lesson this morning is a good one for you. It is entitled Lessons from a Hummingbird. And the scripture text is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verse 26 is where our text is coming from this morning. And <clears throat> I'll read the text and then I'll give you some pictures here to give you a visual of where we're going this morning. And, and the text reads a passage that we're very familiar with. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? I want you to focus on consider the fowls of the air. I want us to pause right there because that's where this text is taking us this morning is considering the birds. I'm a, I'm a big nature lover. I'm a bird watcher. Amen. My wife knows this. I just, I just get all uh, uh, glittery and glowy when I get an opportunity to sit and, and watch the birds mm -hmm. and, and watch them in the morning when they get up. And I, and I think about the scripture that the Lord spoke about how he takes care of the birds. They, they, they're not working. They don't have on uh, cohort pants or, or steel-toed work boots or, or heavy-duty uh, jackets and they don't have any of that. They don't have a big uh, front end loader or any of that. They don't have a, a tiller or plow or, or a disc uh, pulling behind, but yet the father takes care of them. Mm -hmm. DJ Nett, why did you go into that? Because when I wake up in the morning and I, and I go outside on the porch and I look and, and, and the birds, are, they'll, they'll light out from the trees mm -hmm. and they'll just fly down and they'll start just eating. They'll walk and just start eating. And, and while they're eating, they're also singing. They are singing, praising God. You know, if no human being in his right mind has enough sense to wake up in the morning to praise the Lord, the birds have enough sense to wake up in the morning and sing praises unto the Lord. First thing in the morning, they don't wake up talking about their back hurting. They don't, they don't wake up talking about they have cramps. They don't wake up talking about they have a headache. They don't wake up with all of these concerns that we, they wake up and start singing and eating and praising God. And so the Bible says, consider the birds. Well, in considering these birds, I have a series of pictures that I want to share with you as I'm going to get ready to go into the lesson. You see here a fluorescent light in the garage. You see here natural light coming in from a window in the garage. All of this is in my garage. You see a broom. You see a wall and you see an open garage door. Right. Now, Dijonette, what does all of that mean? Let me walk this up for you. <clears throat> Every week I get out and I cut the grass. The truck just happened to be pulled in. I just wanted to give you guys a visual. Both of those garage doors are open and the truck is backed out and I'm out there on the lawnmower working, working out in the yard or whatever. Well, when I got through cutting grass this one particular day, which was last week or so, I come in and I heard some, some humming and some tapping and, and some, some racket. So it, it made me look up and you saw the picture of the fluorescent light. And when I, when I looked up at the fluorescent light, I saw a hummingbird up there at the light. He, 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 he was attracted to that light and he, he wouldn't go. So I said, you know, he, he, he's thinking that is sunlight. So he's attracted to the light. So I went and cut the light off. When I cut the light off, that's when he flew over to the, the window light. He flew over immediately. As soon as I cut the light off, he flew over to the window light in the garage. But he couldn't get any further because there was glass there. But he could not understand why he couldn't get through the, to, the, to the light that he was so desperately trying to get to. Now, what I saw then is, okay, I'm going to have to try to help this bird to, to get free and to be able to go out of those garage doors. And so I went over, and that's where you saw the broom. So I went over to the light, and I got the, the broom, and I held it up between him and the, and the window, the light. And so he was steadily trying to get through to the, to the light, but I'm trying to put up a barrier to block him 
so to, to try to divert his attention so that he can see where he needs to go. But one thing I've noticed, that's not the first time birds have gotten in my garage. And if they get in yours, you'll see the same thing. They are constantly looking up. Birds are constantly looking up. And so what you have to try to do, and this I knew this from other bird experiences, so what I was trying to get him to do was come down and get low enough so that he can see that light, where he could then fly on out. But in that effort, he, he got tired and he, and he went to light down at the, in the, uh, go back to the light in the, in the uh, garage. Okay, for a visual, there's a little pocket or groove that's right down in here. So <clears throat> he went to light down in there, but he got stuck. And so he got stuck and I said, well, where did he go? And I was trying to find the hummingbird. So I went over, I opened up the blinds, and I looked for him, and from the bottom I couldn't see where he was. So I went and got something, a ladder, so that I could get up high enough so that I could see where he was. Well, when I got over to where he was, his beak was sticking up. So I was able to reach down with my hands, grab him by the beak, and when I pulled him uh, up, he went to fluttering and, and his wings went to flapping. And so from there, go back to my wall now. Let me show you the significance of the wall, just the, right there. So from there, he came and he flew over to the top of the wall. Remember what I told you, they're always looking up. So he stood there just, just flapping up at the top of the wall. Well, <clears throat> by and by, what happened was, <clears throat> Over time, he must have gotten fatigued, and his, I'm sure his anxieties were up. And he just, he just, just kind of came on down. But he had enough strength that when he came on down, he, he rotated around, and guess what he saw? There you go. Go back now to the open right there. He came down enough, and he spotted the light. And that's where I was trying to get him to for his own good, for his own best interest. And then from there, he flew, and he, he, he was flying low, and he flew right on over here and, and lighted into this uh, tree line thicket right there. So I wanted to give you a visual, and I know some of you are saying, Dijonette, where are you going with this? Let's get up now <clears throat> to some scriptures, and now I'm, I'm gonna lay this lesson out for you. What I want you to understand, as I parse that out, that there are lights that are in the world that are man-made. And that fluorescent light was a man-made light to the unsuspecting bird who came in the garage. Now, here's, here's my part on that. I didn't let my garage doors up for any type of entrapment. I didn't let my garage doors up to, to harm intentionally a bird. I didn't let my garage doors up for any of those ulterior motives. I just let my garage doors up because I knew that I was going to be working out in the yard. Amen. Now the bird came in through and he got himself in an entrapment. He got himself there. What I'm going to deal with lessons from a hummingbird. I want you to understand that when you are growing up, for those who may not be members of the Church of Christ, this is an evangelistic sermon. For those who may not share in our religious conviction, this is an evangelistic and an informative sermon to help you understand that sometimes people to whom you may have the utmost trust in have reared you up in a certain way in a certain religion, in a certain denomination. Amen. They are not a part of this religion for any ulterior motives of doing themselves harm or doing you any harm. And through the course of your life, they've flown in the garage, if you will, and, they, and you follow right in behind them, right. if you will. Yeah. Are you tracking? Yeah. Yes. And so what attracted when you came into this place, 
you were seeking light, not to know that it was a man-made light. It was a fluorescent light that was made by man. Now, to the bird that was unsuspecting, his eyes gravitated to that light. And as his eyes gravitated to that light, for the life of him, he could not see anything else other than that man-made light. Amen. And he continued to, 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 to wear himself out. He was doing a lot of work. He was flapping his wings. And when you study the hummingbird, it made me go study him just a little bit. They have the ability to flap their wings within the speed of 70 times per second. God has, has, has equipped them to flap their wings in, in one second that goes by, God has blessed that bird to flap his wings 70 times. His heartbeat, he, his, his heartbeat, he, he can beat up to, if I read it right, up to 1,200 heartbeats per minute. So whereas we are, our heartbeat, we're doing all right, some heartbeat, if you're athletic, maybe 50 beats per minute. And, and if you're not so athletic, it may be 75, 80 heartbeats a minute. No, the hummingbird's heartbeat is, can get up to 1,200 heartbeats in one minute. I just wanted to give you some facts about that hummingbird. He has the ability to fly laterally. He can go backwards. He can go forward, and, and he can ascend and, and go up. Amen. He is a truly amazing bird. Some of the old folklore about hummingbirds is that if a hummingbird comes to visit you, is that it is bringing you good news. It is bringing you uh, uh, blessings. So when I was reading this, I was like, okay, hummingbird, you all right with me. <laughs> so, but it is coming to bring you good tidings and good news of, of brand new blessings uh, that, that the hummingbird uh, brings. So as I'm looking at this hummingbird, as, that, as I went through that experience, I did what the Bible said, and I did some consideration thinking about why and how did that, that was the first time a hummingbird came in there. Now some other birds, they've flown in and I've had to do the same thing with them. But now as we go to the scripture, remember, Satan is going to appear unto us that Paul told, coming from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that no marvel or no wonder for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Amen. So as you look at that fluorescent man-made light, I want you to think about how the deceiver has transformed himself into an angel of light. And it is attractive. It is attractive. It is very effective. But it is not the real thing. Amen. Let's go to the next one. Now, in, in John chapter 8 and the verses 12, the Bible says, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. Now, so now you have two lights. You have one man-made light, and then you have the light that is shining through the window. Now, Jesus said, I am the light. I am that true light that all men have to seek for. Amen. You seek for this light. Amen. I'm the real thing. Right. But there's a barrier there. There is something that is blocking, there is something that is blocking his escape. Right. <clears throat> now, I ask the question, what's blocking you from the true light? Amen. Yeah. What's blocking you? Come on. This was some glass. It was clear, and to the bird, he could not tell the difference between what was his barrier. The Bible lets us know that we have barriers in the church and out of the church. Amen. And I want to ask you from the pulpit to the pew, what's blocking you from entering the true light of a relationship with your Savior? There's a barrier there. What is it? Well, there are some ideas. One is traditions. In Matthew chapter 15 in the verses 2, Jesus asked the question. Now, they came to him, first of all, when you go read it, they asked him, why do uh, thy disciples transgress the, the tradition of the elders? That's what they said there in, in verse 2. 
Jesus asked them a question. Why do you transgress the, the laws of God or the commandments of God by your traditions? Amen. Now, so as we look at, and I wanted to keep those visuals in every one of those, so that as you look, now there's light, in it? It's very obvious. There is light. But there is a barrier between the hummingbird getting to where he is trying to go. People are the same way. They are trying to get to the light. But there is something that is a barrier there. If they are not a member of the Lord's house, if they are not a member of the Lord's church that you can read about in the Bible, we're not talking about reading about something in Newsweek magazine. We're not talking about reading something in the Clinton Advertiser, Montgomery Advertiser, the Birmingham News, or, or any other Newsweek. No, we're talking about the Bible, the Word of God. Amen. When you read the Word of God, you have to hear me empirically. You have to be able to find the church in which you attend in the Holy Word of God's Bible. Amen. You have to. The Bible says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to prove the church that you are assembled in, worshiping in, giving in, sacrificing in, and making your hope in, you have to find it in the Lord. Now, Satan, that angel of light, he's coming to deceive people and telling them that the fluorescent light is just as good as the heavenly light. Now, and, and the sad part about it, the people are just like the hummingbird. They cannot tell the difference between the heavenly sunlight and the man-made light. Amen. Jeanette, what are you talking about, about the man-made light? I'm going to make it plain for you. The man-made religions of this world, the man-made churches of this world, the man-made doctrines of this world, the man-made creeds of this world, the man-made traditions of this world. Mm -hmm. Satan has man to cultivate and come up with something and it is attractive to the hummingbird and that's those of us. Amen. Now, he, they're trying to, the bird is trying to get there. People are trying to get to the light but they know that they're being barricaded or blocked or, 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 or kept from it mm -hmm. and they can't understand why. Well, traditions may be one of the problems. If you are in a traditional religion, I'm going to be plain for you, not to be demoralizing, not to be uh, in any way negative from the standpoint of domineering, no, but from informational and educational for your spiritual welfare and health. Amen. So therefore, I say that now to call these names. And if you are in one of these particular religions, then what I'm challenging you to do is go back and do some more reading. The Bible did not build. God did not build. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whether you refer to him as Yeshua, Joshua, uh, Joseph, uh, Allah, whatever you want to refer to him as, just know that we're talking about the Savior of the world. Amen. He came to build and establish one church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Amen. Paul, Peter said, he wanted to suggest to build more than one. He wanted to build one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Christ. He wanted to build a, a, a church of Christ. And, and when you really go back and read what was being spoke about there in Matthew chapter seven, uh, 17, when Peter suggested to build three churches, Peter even suggested to build a Baptist church. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't know that, go read it. When, when Elijah was there, <laughs> When he was there, that great prophet. Let's go there. Because I know some of you looking kind of funny. <laughs> go to Matthew chapter 17. Yes, sir. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 17, <clears throat> I want you to, I just, for reference here, gave the paraphrase or overview of verses 1 down to, uh, we'll get down to where I am. And that's uh, verse uh, 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, 
and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of who? John. Of John the Baptist. So when Peter, when you go back and you read the prophecies, it spoke about that Elias must come before the Christ come. <clears throat> John the Baptist, who was a forerunner for Christ, he came in the power, he came in the mission of Elias, of, of uh, Elijah to prepare people for the way of the Lord. Now, so they were confused. So Jesus is coming back letting them know Elias has already came back and it was John the Baptist. So when Peter said, let us build three churches, one for thee, Church of Christ, one for Moses, Church of Moses, and a one for Elijah, the Baptist church. That was already suggested some 2,000 years ago. Now, for those who are members of the Church of Christ and, and you've been getting confused by man-made light yourself, this is a good lesson and a good checkup from the neck up for you too so that you don't lose your way, so that you don't get confused as to what God is pleased and acceptable of. Amen. Now, as Peter suggested to build these three churches, the Bible says in verse 4 of chapter 17, no, jump down to verse 5. And while Peter yet spake, while the words were still in his mouth, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice, the voice of God came out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear what he has to say. He was not pleased with Peter suggesting to build three tabernacles, three churches, three houses of worship. He, didn't, he was not pleased. Hear me. He was not pleased with Peter suggesting to build a Baptist church. And I know that when you speak to family members, I know that when you speak to friends and neighbors, that they will tell you that the Baptist church is the same as the church of Christ. Well, here it is in the text. Both of them are in the same vein. One church of Christ, one church of Moses, and one Baptist church. And yeah. God spoke from heaven and Amen. said it won't be two others. It's only going to be mine. Amen. Now, you see, when you're getting caught up in nonsense and getting away from the Bible, see, you, you, you'll start talking fool talk and foolish talk, mm. thinking that all of them are just the same or anyone will do, mm. or God is going to accept the others just as along with his own. You've gotten confused by the man-made light. Amen. And you, something is blocking you from getting through to the true light, the heavenly sunlight. Amen. And that's that glass that's blocking you. Amen. And it's your own tradition. Amen. Let's go to the next one. Amen. Preach. There's something else that blocks man from getting to the heavenly sunlight. And that's self-interest. In Mark chapter 10 and the verses 21, when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, this is a parallel story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler. Now, boy, he had it all going for him over here on this side of life. Amen. He was rich. He was young, he had the vigor and vitality of his health, his strength, and his right mind, as far as it refers to the fleshly mind. And he was a ruler. He had authority. He had uh, social standing and social status. Oh, now, but he had a conversation with the Lord. He came running to the Lord, and he said, Lord, what is it that I could do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus went on and explained to him, and he gave him some of the commandments. Oh boy, he was on fire. He said, all of these things have I kept from my youth. Jesus then paused him and said, oh, but there's one thing lackest thou yet. What is your glass buried to getting to the heavenly sunlight? What is that one thing that you're leaving lacking in your personal walk with the Lord. See, it doesn't take but one thing. Right. One thing thou lackest. One thing. What is that one thing in your life? That's a personal question that I want to challenge you with. 
Now, he couldn't get to the heavenly sunlight. That was his glass berry mm -hmm. that was keeping him from getting to that heavenly sunlight. Right. Yeah. Jesus told him, now, what you're going to have to do is go sell off your problem. You're allowing self-interest to get in your way mm -hmm. from having a true relationship with the Father. Amen. Church, don't allow your self-interest of whatever it is. I don't have to go through a litany or a list mm -mm. Uh, uh, or a catalog even mm -mm. to get you to look within your life and take an inventory mm -hmm. of what is the glass that's blocking you Preach. from the heavenly sunlight. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do it. You already know. Right. And this young man here already knew. Now, what was his response when he got the answer? Now, that's the question. What was his response when Jesus gave him the answer? The Bible says he turned and walked away sorrowful. You see, it's a sad day when Jesus gives us the answer of what we have to do to make it to the heavenly sunlight. And we are upset because we have to get out of some stuff. We're upset because we have to break relationship with some stuff. We're upset. Because we have to break ties with some stuff. We're upset. Listen, we read about this guy, about the rich young ruler. Oh, but this also applies to us. Amen. You see, when Jesus shows us the heavenly sunlight and he makes it clear and emphatic on what we have to do to get out of it, we ought to be running away from it, thanking God that he Amen. showed us what we need to do to get out of some of this nonsense. Amen. Not walking away sorrowful. Not putting our hand to the plow and looking back, regretting that we've done it. If Jesus is going to speak to us, if Jesus is going to give us the light of the way to go, then we ought to be rejoicing and singing with joy, with glee, with passion. Any way you bless me, Lord. You know, I'll, I'll be satisfied. You see, but when, you, when we walk away sorrow, that means you really don't want the Lord. You want to hold to, to, to both of them. You want to hold to God and man. And God said, you cannot serve two masters. You're going to have to, you're going to have to let one go and serve the other. And I hope our choice is the Lord. What else is blocking us from getting to that true, true light? Oh, boy. This is a heavy one here. Vanity. Vanity. The praise of men. In John chapter 12 and verse 42, the Bible says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. You see, vanity. Some people can't get to the true light. What's blocking them is the vanity of this world. Amen. The word vanity comes from the root word vain. And vain, we know if you write void on a check that it's no good. You can go, but you can't cash it. There's nothing there. So as Satan is getting us to get caught up in vain glory, what is vain glory, preacher? Oh, you can just put it on anything. You can put vain glory on anything. You can put vain glory on a can of beer. You can put vain glory. Somebody said, preach, what are you talking about? See, I grew up, I grew up in this atmosphere to where a man was a man if he could turn up a beer without pulling it back down. And when he got through with it, it was empty. And then the vanity caused him to squeeze the can and throw it on the ground. I'm a man. Come on, Because I was able to drink this beer without taking a breath. And, and I took the can and crushed it up and threw it on the ground. Or you can take a cigarette. Cigarette. Why do you think cigarettes are so popular? It's not because they taste good. They're downright filthy. They turn your teeth all kinds of colors. And now if you look at some of the chemicals that they're putting in cigarettes, they're even advertising on the warning that, that they'll rot all your teeth out your mouth. Have y'all seen those commercials? And then on the pack, they don't show commercials anymore, but I remember when, when, they, when the person will come out telling you, they have all kinds of stuff, heart, monitor, teeth gone, everything. I'm like, good God, tobacco does that? No, tobacco doesn't do, do that. The chemicals that they've added to the cigarette is what's doing that. And, but anyway, so if, if the cigarette is doing all of that, then you have to ask the question, 
why do people continue to smoke? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we know that from the uh, chemical compound of it, they put some stuff in there that's making you want to do it. Uh, nicotine and, and, and addictive properties in the cigarette that's making you want to continue to puff. But I, I'm not dealing with that, the chemistry of it. What I'm dealing now is the vanity of it. And the vanity of it is they marketed it and it was one cigarette that they even called cool. And they put a play on the word or the spelling K-O-O-L. That is cool. When, when I would go back and I would look at those old movies and, 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 and Kirk, uh, 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 Dick, not, uh, 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 Gregory Peck and Kirk Douglas and all of those old actors, John Wayne, Got his hat kicked to the side. And he, and he talking. Clint Eastwood, he was, he was really known for it. Right before he was getting ready to kill you, he talking real low with one eye closed. And he's smoking, he smoking that cigarette. Well, do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> See, it, it's because <clears throat> they, they're appealing to the vanity. It's not good for you. Then they had one called the, the Marlboro Man. Y'all remember him? He, he had the cowboy hat on and he was riding a, a, a big horse. And, 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 and he, he, he's rugged, he has his chaps on, his cowboy hat and his jacket, and he's cool. Boy, I get, I get a kick out of watching folks smoke. <laughs> yeah, it's all kind of smokers. You got the cuffing smokers. They're going to take the cigarette and they're going to cuff it like it's a joint. <laughs> then you have the sophisticated smokers. They're going to hold it real straight with two fingers and they're going to just get the butt up to their mouth just as gently and just... <laughs> then they're going to thump their ashes a whole different kind of way. See, see, the, see the, the, the guy that don't care nothing about it, he's he just talking and carrying on. He, Bump the ash. <laughs> no. Cool, the, the real sophisticated smoker. No, no, you don't do that. You, you smoke it real proper, and then you go to the ashtray. There you go. <laughs> real delicately, you see. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can work with that a little bit more, but I got to go first. Y'all get the point. All right. So anyway, vanity. I'm still dealing with vanity. I had to just... Let's go back in time a little bit and work with those smokers for just a minute. But vanity, when something is vain, it's no good. And so I forgot how I got over to the cigarette, but, but the praise of man and vanity is what they are selling. And in order to get to the true light, please divorce yourself from seeking, hear me, the praise of men. Do things to maximize your potential. I'm a coach, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a community leader, I'm all of those things. So I've taught that, I've lived it myself. But there's a difference in striving to be your best and being vain. Don't allow any activity, any job, any money, any, any blessing or whatever to come between you and the heavenly life. Amen. Do I need to go any further? Amen. All right, enjoy it, but have sense with it because all of it is vain. Right. And the Bible says that we're all going back to the dust and there's nothing that we have that's going with us to the other right. side. Right. So let us keep our right mind. Amen. Now, as we get to the next verse in John chapter 12 and the verse is 43, for they love, here it is, the praise of man more than the praise of God. And this is why some people can't make it to that true light. Is because they were worried about the praise of men. That if they walk away from a certain group of people, relatives, leave the congregation where all the big timers, big wheels are, they are worried about losing their status with men. Let me tell you something. Jesus already taught that there were two ways. One was a, a broad, wide way. And many are going that way many. in Matthew chapter 7. He said, verse 13 or 14 or so. He says, but it leads to destruction. And many there are which are going that way. Right. 
He said, but now there's a straight and narrow way. And only a few people are going to, to, to have the resolve to pull themselves away from the broad way to get in the narrow way and walk in it. He said, but this way leads unto life. And only a few people, he's saying, is going to choose to walk that straight and narrow way. Amen. You better get away from the praise of men. I've watched this thing. I'm, a, I'm in my middle ages now. But I've watched this even when I was a young man. I'd watch folk pop, boy. They popping. They got the cigarettes in their mouth. They, they have on whatever clothes they want and what have you. They go buy a new car and whatever. I watched stuff. And, and boy, they leaning to the side and, and leaning and can on. And they got the steering wheel turning it like this. You know, all kind of stuff going on. But then I continue to watch them down the road. And the next thing I see, one of the hook caps is missing. So I'm like, now wait a minute. You're supposed to have your business together. One missing hook cap throw all your cool game out the door. When you have three nice rims, three nice rims, and then on the back or the front, you have a black rim with no hook cap on it. Man, you, 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 you ain't hitting on nothing. Because see, if you have your business together, you're going to be able to go to the place and buy you another rim. You're going to have the money to go buy you another tire. So what you've been doing is fronting. You've been front, like you got it all together. But that one black hook cap told me you ain't got nothing going on. <laughs> See, I, wa I watch life, boy. I watch it. Let me get a little taste. Now, in John 12 and 46, the Bible says, I am come a light into the world. And whosoever believeth on me should not abide in what? In darkness. John 12 and 48. Listen, people rejected the Savior of the world because they wanted to hold to tradi tradition. They rejected the Savior of the world because they wanted to hold to self-interest. And they, wanted to reje they rejected the Savior of the world because they held to the last one the praise of men. All right, now listen to what Jesus said in that same text in verse 48. It should be on the screen. He that rejected me and received not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Mm -hmm. Now, in the last day, hear me, church. Hear me, those that are not sharing in our religious conviction. This word of God is going to be the book that's open in the last day that's going to judge us. Yeah. And you, this is, this is not great. You are going to have to find the church in which you have devoted your life to in this book. Amen. Now, let me read this verse again. He that rejected me and receiveth not my word. Get from me Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> Have one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now, you can't get it no plainer than that. You can't get it no plainer than that. Now, in Matthew chapter 16 and the verses 8, uh, start, we're going to start with verse 13. Jesus said in verse 13, the book says what? In Matthew chapter 16, in the verses 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, What? Whom do men say that I am? Who son do of man men am? say that I the son of man am? Read. And they said, And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say thou art John the Baptist. Some Elijah. Some say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah. Others, Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. Or one of the prophets. Come on. He said unto them. He said unto them. But whom say ye that But I who am? do you that's been walking with me? I've been paying your taxes. I've been healing your family members. I've been taking care of you. I've brought you up from the lake with my hand because you were sinking, Peter. Who do you all say that I am? Read. And Simon Peter answered and said, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. 
And Jesus answered and said unto him. Jesus answered and said unto him. Blessed art thou Simon. Blessed art thou Simon by Jonah. For flesh and blood. For flesh and blood, blood didn't give you this answer. Unto thee. Come on. But my father which is in but heaven. But my father which is in heaven. Read. And I say also unto thee. Now I am saying this to you all and to the rest of the world. Read. That thou art Peter. That thou art Peter. And upon this and rock. And upon this rock. I will build my church. I Going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And the gates of hell are not going to be able to prevail against the church of Christ, the church of God, the household of faith, the pillar, and the ground of truth. It ain't but one. It's not but one. Now the book says, "In the last day." I just read it from John twelve and forty-eight. That he that rejected me and receiveth not my words hath one that'll judge him. Now, did he name it? Did he name it? Get from the Romans 16. See, did he leave it up to man to name? Did he, did he leave it up to man to give it a name? See, this is what this is what the world is teaching. That's that that's that barrier between that heavenly light. Remember that garage window. He didn't leave this up for man to name it. Amen. Something this important, he named it himself. In Romans 16 and 16, the book says what? Salute one another with a an holy kiss. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. The churches of Christ salute you. Read. Now I beseech you, brethren. Now I beseech you, brethren. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And avoid them. And avoid them. For they that are such. For they that are such. Serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. But their own belly. But their own self-interest. That was one of the, that was one of the things here. They are serving their own self-interest, free, and by good words and, and by good words and fast speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. They deceive the hearts of the simple. They'll tell you any way to do. Go to the church of your choice. You don't have to go to church. I don't know who, who all going to heaven. Right. I think some of them are going to get some out of all of them. The Bible does not teach that. Amen. Amen. I didn't stutter when I said it. And any of us that's in here walking and stuttering, there's something wrong with your faith. Amen. Amen. Now this is the book. Amen. And what's happening throughout the brotherhood, people are scared to preach the unadulterated word of God. Amen. I'm a preacher. And my job is to save souls. Yes. My job is to destroy strongholds. Yes. My dis job is to pull down stronghold. every stronghold and thing that's working against contrary to Lord's working place. Yes. Yes. Now, this book is going to be opened up at the last day. Yeah. Now, let's go now. Let's go now to 2 Chronicles. I got two scriptures and the lesson is yours. 2 Chronicles, chapter 7. Now, I have in this slide three pictures in one to serve as visuals for you. Now, remember the wall, remember the broom, and remember the opening. Now, in closing, remember I had to try to create a barrier between the bird and the glass that was blocking him from wearing himself out. That didn't work. <clears throat> Church, hear me. You may try to create a barrier by working and teaching and, and, and doing all kinds of things, working with your loved ones. You're that person holding that broom, trying to get them to see different. But they continue to go toward the light with the glass that's blocking their entrance to the true light. Amen. Sometimes what you're going to have to do is allow the bird on its own to fly over to the wall. And, and, and as they are flapping, you know that they're not going anywhere. You're not going to get through this wall. 
So what you're going to have to do is allow them and let God bring them down. Yes. God will humble them yes. through his own way. Amen. One plant, one water, but it's God that adds to the increase. Amen. God may allow some hardship. God may allow some challenges. God may allow some struggles. God may allow the fatigue of working hard in the way they're trying to go to just cause them to kind of wilt on down just like that hummingbird. And, and when it calls them to wilt on down, then, then, only then, will their vision be clear enough to then see the true light so that they can free themselves out the garage door. Now, as we go home now, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and the verse is 14, listen to what God said. If my people, which are called by my name, the first thing they're going to have to do is humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So the first thing that people are going to have to do is humble themselves so that they can hear good sound instruction. And I, and I don't condemn them for not hearing the first try or two because they've been conditioned in this way a whole lifetime. And so one speech, one talk, one teach may not be enough for them. What I advocate for you to do is be patient with them. Remember that it took more than one time for you to get it. It took more than one time for you to see it. It took more than one time for you to understand it. So have the same patience with them that don't know themselves. Amen. Amen. Now, in Isaiah chapter 55 and the verses 12, the Bible says, for you, when you do this, let me let, give everybody a chance to go there. I want you to put eyes on this. In Isaiah 55 and the verses 12, listen to this. There was nobody but God that gave me that inspiration to see what was going on right. with that hummingbird. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's it. Isaiah 55 and the verse is 12. The Bible says, when you humble yourself and let God direct you to the true light, come down off that wall some so that then you can see. It's good to look up, but sometimes you have to look down so that you can see the right way you need to go. Now, and most people are looking up. They want to go to heaven. And they'll quote the verse, Psalm 121, For I look to the hills from whence cometh my help, for my help cometh from the Lord, and so forth. Oh, now, I know you're looking up to God in heaven. But what you're going to have to do is humble yourself to come down some. Look down at the pages of the Holy Writ. Take your eyes off the clouds and look down in the Bible. Amen. And when you look down in the Bible, it's going to point you to an open door. And that open door, when you get the right visual, listen to what it says. The book says, for you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. For you. So you're going to have to look down. You're going to have to look down in the word of God. And when you look down in the word of God, you're going to see that you have purified your souls by obeying the truth unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you then love one another with a pure heart fervent. Amen. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Amen. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. You see, the grass is going to wither, and the flower thereof is going to fade away. But the word of the Lord, that sweet jewel, is going to last forever. And this is the word by which the gospel has been preached unto you this morning. And for those of you that have obeyed the gospel, thank God and clap your hand yeah. that God directed you. To the right place, the right church, you got the right mission, you have the right direction, and now you're going to have to help somebody else to do the same. Amen. That ain't 
almost did up close to it, just about it. Say it with me. That's it. You've been preached the truth this morning. I'm so glad that God have led me to the right life. Now I want to encourage all of us this morning, those that are members, walk in that light. And those that may not share in our religious conviction, allow yourself to be like that bird and to humble down a little bit and let God direct you to the light, that true light, that heavenly sunlight and so that you can walk therein. If you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you need to be by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. Give me your hand. Give God your heart. Give your life to Jesus. Save yourself and them that hear thee. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. 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 Let us all stand.